Okay, so um, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Naila Murray. Uh, she's part of Facebook AI Research, uh, where she is the head of engineering for the Europe and Middle East and Africa area. Previously, she worked in both academia and industry with Princeton University and Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. Um, and in past, re in past research, um, her past research, research focused on computer vision, investigating uh, topics ranging from fine-grained visual categorization, image retrieval to visual attention. Her current research interests include representation learning and weekly supervised learning for visual data. She supports and participates in open research and development that contributes to the artificial intelligence community. And she has served as an area chair for some of the most important machine learning conferences. Today, she'll be introducing deep learning for computer vision. Thank you, Naila, all to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me um, and thanks everybody for joining me. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to give you know a pretty high level introduction to deep learning for computer vision. As you would imagine, computer vision is a very, you know, it's a very diverse area to, um, that can cover many different topics. So I think we could spend a semester or two just focusing on this, right? So what I'd like to do is kind of just give you a flavor of you know, the variety and the diversity of tasks that we tackle and some sense of modern approaches based on deep learning for tackling these problems. So it, the talk will basically be in three major parts. So first I'll, I'll introduce for folks who may not know, I imagine that probably everybody who's attending has some sense of what computer vision is, but just to be sure we don't lose anybody, I'd like to just give you know, a sense of what, we, what people tend to include in the term computer vision. Then I will go into some detail on um, convolutional networks, which is, I would say like the workhorse architectural framework for computer vision models. So by no means is this, um, uh, you know, is this comprehensive because there are other types of networks that uh, and architectures that people do use for computer vision, but this is certainly, I would say, used in, in probably the, the vast majority of, of, um, of architectures for this problem. And then lastly, I will kind of go through a few, let's say classical um, computer vision problems and some reference approaches for tackling it. Okay, so let's dive in. So what's computer vision? So if I could explain it in a slide, which I can't, right? But if you would try to summarize what computer vision is in a slide, it's basically saying, given that I have some kind of visual signal, be it uh, an image or like a video stream or something like this, how can I extract meaning from that signal, right? So how can I do things like recognize objects, detect objects, um, segment the image into different reg regions in, in terms of their semantic content, etc. So what, what, what might some of these things mean in more detail? So if you're given an image like this, you might ask yourself, um, you know, what are some other certain objects of interest within this image? And if so, where are they? So I'd like to kind of localize them with, for example, a bounding box, as you can see here. And this is, you know, a very classical problem in computer vision. You might want to query the, the image. You might want to have some form of visual question answering where you might see, you might ask, is this image depicting an outdoor scene? Yes, or what is the weather like, right? And it could be, for example, in this case, cloudy, but dry. You might also want to recognize certain activities that are happening in the, in the image. So you might want to know, okay, so you, now that you know that there's a jackal there, you, it'd be interesting for you to know if that, person, that jackal is walking or not, or stationary. You might also want to estimate the pose of objects within the scene. So in this case, you might want to know exactly where are all the relative locations of certain key body points, um, certain key points in this object. You might also want to be able to caption images. You might want to say, given this image, could, it, could, could I have a sort of short textual description that summarizes fairly well you know, what's being depicted in the image? As I mentioned before, you might want to perform semantic segmentation in which you can you know, ascribe a semantic label to every uh, pixel within that image. You might also want to perform depth estimation. So you might want to know, given this image, 
you might want to assign a, a value to every pixel within that image. It gives you some indication of how far is that pixel, uh, whatever object being described in the pixel, how far is it from the camera? And lastly, you might also want to perform 3D shape estimation. You may want to have some sense of what's the shape of a specific object in the image. Okay, so that's by no means exhaustive, but I hope that gives you a sense of the diversity of tasks in, in computer vision that kind of fall under this term we call computer vision. Um, but then as you will see later on in the, in the third part of this talk, as diverse as they are, the backbone for most of them are quite similar and they'll be mostly um, convolutional networks. Um, you know, and with the right loss functions and with the right sort of frameworks, you know, that you can tackle quite this, quite a wide variety of things. Ah, yes, I forgot this last example. So this is also an interesting example um, of visual localization. So in this case, um, let's imagine you have like a map of some more global scene. And if you're given an image that's taken somewhere within this map, you might like to know, um, you know, where, where was this image taken within this broader map, right? So for example, you would say, okay, I, I know based on this image somehow, I'd like to know that I'm located at this point within this, this map of, of the more global region. Okay, so let's take a look at convolutional networks. So I assume, I'm assuming here that most of you are familiar with deep learning and deep networks more generally. So some of these things may be already familiar to you, but I'll go through them um, in any case. So convolutional networks are based off of, you know, there's once again, right, there's a huge diversity of them, but they tend to be, which might be perhaps surprising, composed really of these key building blocks, more or less. Um, and just in you know a huge variety of configurations, but you know the possibilities for combining these are pretty much endless. But um, you know just with these sort of four basic building blocks, you can do quite a lot of different things. So I'll just go through each of those um, one by one. So first we have uh, fully connected layers. So these are fairly basic, right? So it's basically it can be described with the equation you see there on the bottom. So it's, it's really a dense matrix multiplication. So let's imagine you have some input, um, some input signal, signal of vector X um, and you have a matrix of weights W plus some bias vector B, then you, know, you can implement a fully connected layer with the equation that you see here that gives you this output um, hidden vector H, okay? Um, So just to see like a very quick um, toy example, basically, let's imagine you have like a five dimensional vector X, that's your input. Um, to compute the output, the, the scalar output H1, you, you know, simply multiply by these, these lines which represent weights, right? So you have five weights here that you, you combine with this equation here, very simply. I'm not showing the bias for now, but you, you can see it to give you this output, right? And if you just simply repeat this, Right, like by with a five by five weight matrix W, you get a five by five, a five by one output vector, right? So that's pretty much fully connected layers in a nutshell. So convolutional layers now um, are somewhat similar, but they have a few key differences that I'll describe a bit later on. So just to, to give you a heads up, so most machine learning libraries actually implement convolutional layers as cross correlation, cross -correlation layers. So they're, they're quite, they're extremely related. It's not a huge difference between them. So if you look at kind of like the basic um, formulation for the convolutional operator, which is actually what you see down here. And if you compare it to the cross correlation operator, which you see up here, you can see that there's just basically only one difference, which is that the second, the second signal K is, is flipped, right? So sort of inverted. So just to describe this in a bit more detail. So what these two operators are doing is you're taking in two signals. So you have a signal I and you have a signal K. And what you're doing is you're, in both cases, you're computing the integral of the product of these two signals. You're assuming that these two signals are sort of of infinite extent, but there are ways to get around this in the practical case by sort of just padding with different things. So for example, you can pad with zeros in the practical case where you have a finite signal. But assuming you have sort of like an infinite signal, you simply, compute the product of that at every um, location, you integrate over that, right? So the integral is the sum you have here, and then you integrate over 
the same operation for shifted values of this signal. Okay, so for example, here you're shifting one of the signal with respect to the others, and then you're summing over this, this, um, this integral. So I'll describe in a minute sort of like what this is actually doing, right? So this is the operation, but why is this an interesting operation? Okay, so, so as it says down here, so what this is doing is it's quantifying like the presence of one signal in a shifted version of the other. So in some sense, it's acting as a pattern recognizer, right? And this will be very critical for representing representation learning. And by the way, so here I didn't mention, but so here I'm showing you an example for the 2D case where you have like a two dimensional signal, um, but this is arbitrary, right? So this can extend to, of course, the 1D case, but you know, the 3D case, 4D case, et cetera. So we can go through this with a, once again, a toy example. I think this helps to kind of illustrate what's going on. So let's say you have, and here I'm just repeating the, com the cross correlation operator down here for reference. So let's imagine you have this, this 5D image, well, or signal I, but I mean, it's uh, you can think of it sometimes as an image, sometimes it's, it's helpful. And then you have this kernel case. This kernel is very practically when you come across convolutional um, implementations, you will see something called a filter and you can think of it in the same way. It's, 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 you can almost consider it to be in interchangeable. So if you wanted to convolve or in this case, compute co cross correlation between these two, for example, if you wanted to output um, I cross correlated with K at this position zero, zero, you would simply, as I mentioned before, and as your operation below here indicates, you, you shift K to the relevant location, you compute the product at each location, you integrate over that, and that gives you your value. Okay, so this gives you this output one here. And you can view this as a sliding window operation. So this is what the shifting of the signal K does, right? So let's imagine you have your image I, you have your signal K. So what the shifting is doing, so this M plus N, which is being changed um, as you go, is you're computing this inner, you're computing this inner thing as you shift, right? So to get this output, you compute this, you compute at this, position you see here, right? So you multiply each of these values and then you sum them up and this gives you one. And then as you shift, you just perform the same operation, right? You compute the, the product, you sum up and that gives you the value. And as you go, you get, you know, this is, this is the result that you see. So very often you will hear, you know, something referred to as a feature map. And this is really what the feature map is. It's the output of this cross correlation operation between your input signal and um, whatever filter that you have. So for often, sometimes you will see this um, illustrated with like a heat map, so, or sort of like this, um, this grayscale map between you know, where dark values indicate low activation and lighter values indicate high activation. So once again, this is, you know, this is just one more, a different visualization of the same type of um, output. And so here, what's interesting to see is that you can kind of see the, the, the pattern recognition aspect of this operation coming out. Because for example, if you consider, if you see this as the input I, and you want to indicate the presence, you want to get a sense of where, in which, which regions of this input I match with this filter or this kernel over here, you can see that the output gives you some sort of indication, some sort of rough indication of where does this pattern match within this, um, this in input image, right? So you can see that, for example, in the top left, it's there's sort of like low similarity with this kernel. And then you can see the top left value is low. And for different regions of the input, you can see like um, a corresponding activation or response in the output. So that's sort of like the building block for a convolutional layer. Of course, it's like a bit more complicated than that and you'll see it as it go along. So before I want to show how this basic um, convolutional or cross correlation operator is combined to create a full layer, I just want to make a few key comparisons between um, the convolution and a fully connected layer. So here I'm just showing you, you know, what, it, what we looked at before. So the fully connected layer. And if we compare to a convolutional layer, let's say we have the same input, 
and we wanted to compute an output. One thing that's interesting to note, the first thing is that there's sparse connectivity, right? As opposed to um, this, this, as the name suggests, fully connected layer, where every, in the fully connected case, every output is, um, is a function of every input. In the case of the fully connected layer, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and it's usually not the case. So in a typical example, in most convolutional networks you'll see these days, the vast majority of convolutions happen in, um, at least for visual, at least for computer vision, with a three by three um, convolutional filter or kernel. Right, so you can see it's, it's, so H1 in this case, for example, is only a function of these three values, but not the, not the last two. Okay, so. These are how the outputs would be computed in this case. And very often, as I mentioned before, given that there is um, most signals tend to have finite extent, very often people use the approach of zero padding in order to sort of extend the results to the case where there's no, um, to sort of like extend the signal artificially by padding it with zero values. And there are different ways to pad. So, you know, this is one classical way, but there are different ways. So as I mentioned before, like as I was contrasting the two in on one side, we have dense connectivity and then the other side, we have sparse connectivity. So in the example I'm showing here, if we wanted a five dimensional output for the fully convolutional case, we would, this would require five by five multiplications. Whereas in this case, we'd require five by three multiplications, right? Because for every output, in this case, we have five, we're multiplying with just three, um, three input values instead of five. So you can see that this sparse connectivity has one sort of um, important difference is that it's, um, it's very often the case that it's much more, um, it's less computationally intensive due to the sparse connectivity. It also scales much better. So let's imagine we had a 5, 25 dimensional output. This would require 25 by 25, um, uh, well, it's a set of op op operations, multiplications. Whereas in, in the convolutional case, it just scales linearly, right? So it scales linearly with the amount of, um, with the output size that you want. So this means that it's, you know, you can imagine that if you scale up to, let's say realistically sized data, because of course, you know, in the, in the, real, in the real case, we're not, we're not having five dimensional inputs. You can see like how big of a difference this is and, and why this is, one of, this is one of the key reasons why um, convolutional networks are so preferred because they're just so much less expensive. Another key difference is the value of having, or the benefits of having shared weights. So once again, if we look at our example, for this three by three, um, sorry, for this five dimensional output with five input values, we require a five by five matrix. Okay, so we have 25 weights. Whereas in the convolutional case, our weights are shared, right? So remember, if you, can, if you look back to the example of us shifting this kernel, in for convolutional networks, these kernels are actually our learned weights, right? So that means that as we shift the kernel, we're using the same kernels, so we're using the same weights. Um, and so that's, you know, another very appreciated property, the fact that we can share these weights in these kernels. And so this example, these weights are all shared, right? So when you compute H1, H2, H3, the weights that you use to compute them are shared across all the outputs. And once again, if you think of, if you scale up, so if you think of not having like a five by five problem, but you have like 25 by 25 problem, once again, it scales much better because in this case, even if you increase your, the, the dimensionality of your input and your output by a factor of five, you're using still exactly the same number of weights. So once again, like the convolutional layers tend to require, they tend to involve significantly fewer weights. Now, now this is not quite, um, a fair comparison because to, as you will see very soon, normally when you have a convolutional layer, you don't just have one filter, you tend to have multiple filters. So then now the, the, um, the comparison here is not entirely fair, but you'll see that it's still, it still scales much better generally. So I, we mentioned, we started off talking about four different um, building blocks typically. So now we're on to number three, right? So we, we looked at fully connected layers, we looked at convolutional layers, and so now I'm going to show uh, pooling layers. So pooling is an operation that, um, once again, you know, there's a lot of diversity in different types of pooling strategies you can take. 
And the type of pooling strategy you take will depend a lot on the type of problem that you're tackling and certain assumptions you make about your data. But the overall goal is to sort of aggregate or summarize some subregion of your input. So let's look at our convolutional example here, a 1D example. A pooling layer will, to some, to, to, it will basically attempt to sort of summarize or create some aggregate statistics over some subregion of your signal. Right. So if you imagine you have some sort of pooling function f, you have um, a subregion a, then pooling was just a function of that, and you can have different different functions. Most typically, people use max pooling, which is you know as simple as you see here. So basically, whatever subregion of your signal you're looking at, you just compute the maximum value within that subregion. And another obvious um, alternative is to simply average. Okay. So this is just a way to sort of um, summarize your, your intermediate representations or feature maps or outputs, however you want to, to call it. So just to give an example here um, for the case of max pooling, let's say you, you performed a convolution of X that gave you this hidden representation here in green and max pooling will simply um, perform the max over these local regions. By local, I mean that once again, it's sparsely connected, right? So you have, and it's, um, it's a sort of contiguous local region of your signal. So in this case, it's, let's say, um, just three contiguous values, and you just compute the max over that. So in this case, you get 1.2, and you actually get the same max value um, as you shift this pooling operation um, step by step. So one interesting to note, thing to note here is that let's imagine that you shift your you shift your your signal so if you compare to the previous slide you're just adding in a, a zero uh, padding on the top and you're shifting your signal one down by one position down okay so all the values are have um, have moved downward this way and let's just see what happens if you compute the pooling operation once again so in this case you see that the pooling values have not changed that much, right? So if you look at the previous example, these are the values you see here at, as the output of the pooling. And if you shift your signal by one value, you see that the, the output of the pooling has not changed much. So this is just to illustrate one, one property that tends to be, that's, um, tends to be like a motivation for using pooling, which is that it allows for a bit of translation invariance. And this is, this is, I would say, sort of like an inductive bias for computer vision, which has proven to be very useful, which is this concept that, let's imagine you have some visual signal. If your visual signal changes, is shifted by some degree, let's imagine you crop it slightly differently, you, sh you would not expect, it's not necessarily useful, and it's perhaps of, uh, actually detrimental to have your representation shift dramatically. Because if the semantic content in your image has not changed, what you would like is to have some invariance to the representation of that. And pooling is one way to, um, to introduce some sort of inductive bias of this, of this kind. Another thing is that it's, it's often useful, once you perform pooling, um, you might want to do some sort of signal compression because you, it, at this point, you might have a bit of redundancy in your representation. So for example, if you see these output here, you can see they all have the same value. And so you might want to just subsample it. And this is sort of has, uh, a nice property, which is that, you know, of course, once you compress your signal, it allows you to, it, you know, it makes your whole network more efficient. Okay, so, so I've, yeah, I've discussed pooling, maybe I could have discussed it before actually, but um, I want to just get back to this point I mentioned before, which is that um, when we were comparing fully connected um, layers to convolutional layers, I mentioned that there, it's not like exactly a fair comparison because convolutional layers tend to include multiple filters. So I'll just like show you an example of that here. So, so like a practical convolutional layer that you would implement in, you know, like in a typical deep learning um, uh, architecture, it would look more like this one. So let's imagine you have like your sort of input tensor. So let's say you have this example I'm showing you here, this sort of toy example where you have, you know, a three dimensional tensor with a width w, height h, and a depth um, d. And let's imagine you have your, your kernel or your filter 
k, which in this case is showed by the sort of overlaid yellow uh, vector here. And so this, what I'm showing you here is like a one by one um, kernel with, with depth d. And uh, so what you would do is you would, you know, perform the same operation I showed you before. So you compute the product and you integrate, and then you shift over, um, you do this for shifted versions of your kernel, right? And then, and, the, and then this gives you sort of like your feature map, right? So this is like pretty much what I showed you before. But like in a real convolutional layer, you don't just have one filter, you tend to have C filters, right? And so you perform that same operation um, for C different filters. And this gives you um, an output that has C so-called channels. And once you have this output, typically you apply some nonlinearity, which I'll describe a bit in some detail now. And this is, this is sort of like um, your basic convolutional layer. Okay, so um, speaking of nonlinear activation layers, these are introduced typically into the computational graph or, or the convolution or, or the network that you're, that you're, you're, you're designing, um, which allows, it allows you to increase by, you know, increase significantly the expressivity of your, of your network, right? This is what allows your network to be extremely flexible and to allow it to, um, to represent very complex signals. Okay, so these nonlinearities, um, you know, create the the nonlinearity of the network, which means that you know you can't reduce it to a single layer, and it allows it allows you to be very flexible. So some common commonly used functions, which you may have seen um, previously, include, for example, rectified linear units, which, as the function implies here, as the function describes, it's um, it leaves your input unchanged unless it's negative, in which case it, it, um, it maps that value to zero. So it maps all negative values to zero and leaves other values unchanged, basically. Another very commonly used nonlinear function is the sigma function. So this takes some scalar value as input, any real value, and maps it to a value between zero and one. So you will see this used quite in, in a lot of different places. Um, and then you have the hyperbolic tangent function, which is also like a sort of a sigmoidal function, but it takes any real value and it maps it to a value between negative one and one. You tend to see this used a lot, for example, in, um, in convolutional networks for GANs and you know, other places that you see it for GANs very often as well. Okay, so I showed you all the bounding, all the building blocks. So to put everything together now, um, you know, a typical deep network or convolutional network would chain sort of all the things I showed together, right? With nonlinearities in between them. So for example, you might have like a first block that's a convolutional layer, you with a nonlinearity sort of like um, paired with it, then you sort of just keep chaining these together, right? Until you get uh, some, some number of blocks that will be chosen depending on, you know, many factors, right? So this is where a lot of the sort of the art of of architectural design comes into play. All these decisions about exactly how to, to structure your model. And you know you, you don't necessarily have to have a chain, right? So very often you have things like, for example, skip connections. So, the idea, so in general, you have, you tend to have um, directed graphs or so directed acyclic graphs. They're not necessarily chained. They can be very complex, right? But in general, they tend to be directed and acyclic. So one last thing I want to mention is, because um, you know, one might ask, this is all well and good, but sort of why did we come to this, or why did we converge to this type of this type of network? So I think one good place to start, or at least a kind of um, a milestone that 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 you know you can see it sort of led us here, is the perceptron. So this was like a, a, a seminal algorithm in machine learning that was introduced by Rosenblatt in the 1950s, and so this was this had as a core function what I'm showing you here. And this has been called, you know, by various names, so a neuron or a node or a unit, um, where, as you can see, what it's doing is combining a linear function with a nonlinearity, right? That's saying if it's less, if it's above zero, you perform something or zero otherwise. Um, so it's a, a step function. And critically, you know, these weights, this this part of linear function is learned, right? So this is where the the learning comes in using some kind of optimization procedure. And so this, this, you know, this, this algorithm came out through biological inspiration and it has inspired 
in turn, you know, a, a lot of learning algorithms, including modern neural nets, right? So this just gives you some sense of the inspiration for pairing linear functions with nonlinearities. And those linear functions could be um, convolutional filters or um, fully connected layers. So before I go into some examples of modern deep networks, I wanted to, um, to just touch very briefly on what, how do people try to understand what deep networks learn, right? So very often there's a discussion, um, there's a kind of narrative that deep networks are black boxes and we don't really have an idea of what's happening within them. And while it's certainly true that it's hard to explain for, you know, in human terms, their actions are quite, um, they're quite transparent, right? The question is in terms of how do we interpret them in a human understandable way. And so throughout the years, throughout the past 10 years or so, um, probably earlier than that, but certainly very much so in the past few years, there've been, you know, a wide variety of attempts and different proposals for understanding, um, you know, what deep networks are learning, what they're computing, what these representations are really um, representing. And so I, I'm just listing a few of them here. A lot of them in, involve visualization, which um, is a bit of an advantage, I would say, for visual content, right? So although there've been a lot of approaches for, for other types of content, for example, text, um, text, and text networks or NLP networks, how to interpret them too. So here, I just wanted to show you a couple examples of ways that we can kind of probe what deep networks are actually representing. So one way that I think is pretty intuitive is to look, take a network, in this case, I'm showing an example from Zylan Fergus from 2014 of a network that was trained on classification. And what you can do is look at the output of the network, the output prediction for, for the true label um, as a function of corrupting the input image and to understand how the classification changes as the input image is corrupted, okay? So what's happening here, let's look at this first example. What I'm showing on the top is the input image with, with, that's been corrupted by some way by just putting like a gray box um, in a region. And the, the, what I'm showing you here is the, the, the classification probability for the label Pomeranian, which is a grown, which is a true class, okay? And what you're seeing is this map that's showing you, um, it's a map of the output of this, um, of the activation for this label for Pomeranian as a function of the position of this, um, this gray box, right? So you can see that basically, if the gray box is in the top left, then the, the activation for the true label is high. So in this, in this map, red indicates high and the bluer values indicate um, a low value. So what it's basically showing you is that once this gray box is sort of like not in the center of the image, the, this, um, the probability for the true label is high, right? So it's high at all these locations of the, of the corruption of the gray box. Once the gray box starts to hit the center, so once it starts to occlude the face of the dog, then you see that the, the classification probability for this class drops precipitously, right? So this at, least, it's, this at least gives you sort of a sanity check, right, of your model. So it's telling you that I know for sure that my model is paying attention to what I intuitively think is important for this class. And so this, this is not giving you maybe like a deep understanding of what every single layer is doing, but at least it's a good, it's a very good method to, to, to make sure that your, math, that your model, for example, is not learning sort of spurious things, like it's not paying attention to things it ought not to. Another one that's somewhat similar is, um, is asking sort of like a different question. So this was work um, done by, by Google Brain, I believe. Uh, and it's asking the question, let's say that I have trained my model and I would like to know what would be a type of input image that would sort of maximally activate my model? What would my model be super confident about? Um, what sort of image would make my model super confident for a given class, right? So let's imagine you have this model, you've, you've trained it for classification, for image classification. And um, you'd want to understand, okay, if I take the category measuring cup, what is, um, how can I optimize an input image such that it maximally, maximally activates this measuring cup um, category? And then you see these like very interesting outputs that's seeing that's showing you sort of like what, almost like a kind of condensation of this class for the, for the model. And what's interesting here is that I, as I was mentioning before, these things can be 
an interesting sanity check, right? Because you can see this interesting example that they showed, that the author showed, where if you look at the class dumbbells, um, the model is, is hallucinating sort of these arms attached to the dumbbells, right? So you can see that in this case, a model has learned this association between dumbbells, but also arms onto this. So you can see this is like a spurious kind of correlation that, um, that shows you that there's a bias in this data set that in general, when you have images of dumbbells, they tend to have somebody holding onto them, right? So this is a nice way to kind of um, probe certain, um, let's say degenerate behavior in your, uh, not just in your models, but in your data most likely, right? Okay, so lastly, I wanted to just give you some sense of, you know, I mentioned a bit before, like the milestone of the, 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 the perception algorithm, but I wanted to give like a somewhat deeper, um, you know, more broad set of milestones in deep learning for computer vision. So I think one important milestone to note, to note is the introduction of neural networks. So this was, um, this is a very simple network, but it was one, it was one of the first, if not the first, um, described neural network that you would recognize today as a neural network. So this was um, introduced in the 40s by McCullough and Pitts. And as I mentioned before, so in the 50s, the perception was introduced by Rosenblatt that had this very interesting idea of pairing these linear functions with nonlinearities and then learning um, the weights of that linear function. Um, in the 70s, backpropagation was introduced um, and then also applied in that, in, that, uh, in that decade for neural networks itself. So the combination of backpropagation applied to neural networks was applied as well. A bit later on, so we had the introduction of the neo neocognitron by Fukushima. So this was, this has been, um, I think this can be described as sort of like the first pretty deep network um, and a convolutional network at that that was described. Uh, in 1989, we had the use of such a convolutional network paired with backpropagation for you know, a task of handwritten digit recognition that was quite successful. This is also a very important milestone. And then you see there's gonna be like a bit of a gap <laughs> in which um, you know, there are many other things sort of happening in the in, in machine learning field, including a lot of time um, where people were really developing a lot of theory um, with kernel methods, for example. Um, in 2009, so ImageNet was published. So this is, you know, this data set that you, you may have heard of that has millions of images. So it has up to 10 million images and maybe more at this point, I don't know. Um, so this was, this was like the first truly large scale image data set with annotations uh, to important to note, right? So every image was labeled with um, a specific label. And in 2012, there was a seminal work as well, which won the, a competition based on ImageNet, which is basically to train, it's called like the ImageNet large scale um, visual recognition challenge. And the challenge for this, this um, the challenge here is to categorize images into 1000 different categories. And um, you know, it's quite a competitive challenge and AlexNet, which was a convolutional network trained on ImageNet uh, performed you know, extremely well at this challenge, which, um, which was a key milestone for this explosion of deep learning that we we're currently living in. So I would say that the, the most recent revolution that we're, as I said, we're sort of currently living in right now could be are due in fairly large part to sort of three things. So one is large scale data. So I mentioned ImageNet before, which is a real catalyst for this. Um, also hardware accelerators. So the use of GPUs and understanding how they can be used to accelerate a lot of um, matrix multiplication and other computations. And then lastly, some architectural breakthroughs. So for, for example, the you know, effective use of, of, um, of ReLU as a nonlinearity was also key to this. Okay, so I hope that gives you sort of like a sense of the broader picture of, of you know, how we have come to, to where we are now. So now in the last section, I'll take you through um, some modern approaches to, I would say pretty traditional computer vision tasks. So I mentioned this just recently. So the first CNNs um, were inspired by, they, were, they took a lot of biological inspiration from certain key insights from neuroscience. So in particular, um, you know, how models of visual cell types um, were developed in the brain. So for example, the neocognitron that I mentioned um, a few slides before was, you know, directly incorporated certain notions, right? These notions of these localized um, filters that were specialized to fire for certain visual patterns. So this was something that 
you know, while many people like to sort of scoff at the idea that, oh, okay, neural networks have nothing to do with, uh, with how the brain works, and that's probably true, but certain key insights were certainly incorporated, right? And this is, this is one of them. And as I mentioned before, so the seminal work by Lacan et al um, on digital classifiers successfully took this type of model, um, these sort of deep convolutional models and used backpropagation to, to train a model for a digit classification, okay? So this, uh, what I'm showing you here is directly taken from, the, from this work by Lacan et al. And it's, um, it's taking this input image and it's, as I mentioned before, sort of simply stacking different, these different building blocks that I mentioned to you. So you're starting with convolutions, you take some subsampling, which is a type of pooling. I don't remember what pooling was used here, but some sort of pooling operation, followed by another convolution, more subsampling, um, and then at the end using um, fully connected layers to, before you're outputting your classification probabilities. So these are sort of like the building blocks I showed you in action for this task. So more recently, there have been, um, the networks are extremely recognizable in terms of what I just showed you. The difference is really in terms of the types of architectural choices that are made, right? So another very seminal um, architecture for image classification that has been used for ImageNet and has been used for many other classification problems is um, the VGG series of, of models um, proposed by Simonian and Zissiman. And so here, what, what this, this sort of network schema is showing you is a specific deep network architecture that takes as input an image and then once again stacks in this sort of a chain um, a series of convolutions. So here you're having a three by three kernel, right? So very similar to what, I, what we went through before, right? The example I showed you. And in this case, um, as I mentioned before, typically a convolutional layer has multiple filters, right? In this case, there are 64 filters, which means that the output of this convolutional layer will give you um, a 64 channel feature map, okay, like 3D feature map. And basically combining this with some pooling layers at intermediate steps gives you like some output representation after which you apply um, a series of fully connected layers before adding on like a classification layer at the end, okay. And so more recently we've had ResNets. So these are um, convolutional networks with these um, residual connections that are, they're often called or skip connections here. Uh, and this I would say is, um, is pretty much the dominant architecture right now for, not, for, for image classification problems, but also for many other downstream classification, um, downstream tasks associated, like, so tasks beyond classification that as you will see in a few slides. And so maybe one note on these. So these residual connections are very, um, you know, they've been shown to be quite effective and not just in terms of, uh, of, let's say carrying or propagating information from earlier layers to later layers without sort of intermediate processing, which has been shown to be very helpful. Um, but then also for back propagating. So when you perform back propagation in the back propagation step, you're allowed to carry signal, gradient signal from pretty deep in the network back to pretty early layers, if, if the network learns that this is sort of um, valuable, basically. So this has been shown to be very useful for sort of like um, carrying information, both in the forward propagation and back propagation. So that's image classification. So um, another very classical computer vision problem is object detection. And you know, this is one example that I showed you at the beginning of this talk where you're given an image and you'd like to detect every instance of some set of semantic categories. So as you would imagine, typically for object detection, you have a set of categories of interest. So you're not gonna be able to necessarily detect everything in the world, right? Um, so the idea normally is that you might have for some specific application, some set of categories that are of interest to you. And you would like to determine whether there are any instances of those categories within the image that you're analyzing. And just to give you a sense of like the, the, the difficulty potentially in this problem is that let's, if you look at this example here, you, you, you may not necessarily just want to know, okay, there are dogs here, but you would like to like the breed of the dog. So you can see that this can be a very fine grained problem um, and quite challenging potentially. So here I'll just show you one popular um, detection model called YOLO. This was um, introduced by Redman et al. In, this, in, in 2016. 
And so once again, you know, this will start to be very familiar with you, the, the, the model, right? So it takes an input image. You have a series of convolutional layers combined with max pooling layer. And in here you have nonlinearities, but they're so ubiquitous very often, they're not even mentioned, right? So I'm showing you this, this, um, this image from the, this figure from the, the paper itself. And you have sort of like a series of these with different choices in terms of the size of the kernels that you're using, for example, and the number of channels that you're using. So these are all hyperparameters that you choose basically by, by a combination of intuition and trial and error. And then once again, at the end, you have these outputs uh, fully connected layers, right? So what's interesting about object detection as opposed to classification, at least in this case, so what you're getting at the output layer is not simply just a list of the probability of each category being present in the image. What this particular model architecture did is it gives you, um, it predicts for you at the output layer, um, a series of different things. So you have um, an output tensor that for which every, there's a spatial um, relationship between um, one vector within this tensor, within this 3D tensor, and a specific region of your input image, right? So let's say your input image is, uh, is this input image. What the output does is it sort, of, it sort of associates every output vector with um, some cell within this grid. And then it predicts for that grid, whether there is an object centered on that grid, what are potential bounding boxes of the object within that grid, and what are potential categories of the object within that grid, okay? so. For each of these cells, you have this prediction, and this is sort of represented here, where you have for every little grid, you have like a prediction on a, on a boundary box and the boundary box's shape. And then you also have for every grid, a prediction of what is the category there. And basically by combining these two things, so combining where is your potential object, what is the object, and then very importantly, what is the confidence of there being an object? Combining these things together, you get um, and reduce removing potential objects with low probabilities, you get some sort of final short list of highly likely um, objects with their locations. So moving on, so I see we have like nine minutes left, but we'll get there. So moving on to another problem, instance level segmentation. So as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, so segmentation is the problem of um, associating pixels to labels. In this problem of instance level segmentation, we're concerned with what you might call the foreground objects, right? So you can see here, you're not in this specific instantiation of the problem. We're not labeling every single pixel, but we're labeling certain, um, we're labeling only for certain objects in a, in a short list of objects of interest. And what we like to do is to um, detect all instances of a given object. For example, we would like to detect all the people and we also like to separate them. So we like to know this person is distinct from this other person. And we'd like to have like a, a pixel wise um, segmentation of that person. So one, um, one very popular approach to do this is called Mask RCNN by He et al. Um, and I would just note, note one interesting about this, interesting aspect of this model, which is that um, it's, it's a very intuitive model, I would say in the sense that once again, the, the, what we might call the backbone of the architecture is a convolutional network. What changes is really what is, what is um, predicted at output time, right? So at output time, what this model does is it predicts several things. So it predicts where are there um, objects with a bounding box. It predicts what's in the bounding box, so what is the label of the object. And then it predicts a segmentation mass. So it just basically says, given this bounding box, um, I'd like to predict a, a binary mass that says for every pixel within this bounding box, does the pixel correspond to the object of interest or not? Okay. So moving on to another problem. So this is a problem of image matching or retrieval. So um, let's say you have a query image and you have like a very large database. Imagine you have a database with a million or a billion images. What the problem, what this problem is, is a problem of taking this image comparing it somehow to this your database and coming out with a list of images that depict either like a similar image or, or an image that depicts exactly the same object. And this can be quite challenging because as you see, the, you'd want to be able to do this even for 
um, images that look quite different, right? So what you'd like to do is to find an image with the same object, even though that object might have been taken, the picture might have been taken at nighttime or from a different angle or a different time of year, et cetera. So one popular method for this is called deep image retrieval, um, work done by Gordo et al. And so this work, um, it, uses the, it uses a triplet loss. So the, a triplet loss is a loss function that says, let's say I have three, I have a triplet. So this triplet is a triplet of images um, where you have a query image, you have an image that is relevant to the query. So specifically in this example, um, the Im both images represent the same, the same building in this case. And then you have a non-relevant image. So you have in this case, an image of a, a different building, right? So let's say you have this triplet of images. What the triplet loss is doing is it's saying it incurs a loss if, your, if the, the distance between the relevant image and the query image is not um, sufficiently bigger than the difference between this query image and your non-relevant image. So what it's basically doing is enforcing that if you have a representation, like a vectorial representation of all three images, which is computed with this convolutional network you see here, and it's using the same convolutional network for all three images. So you use this convolutional network, you compute three vectorial representations. And what the loss is saying is that if the difference in the vectors, right, basically the distance between the two is um, the distance for the two relevant images is not, um, is not sufficiently smaller than the distance from the relevant image and the non-relevant image, then, um, then this, is, this is incurs a loss. And then you have to update your model to enforce that better. Okay, so it's pretty intuitive. And this is used, it's a very, uh, very, I would say dominant approach to this problem of image retrieval and matching. Another problem is action and activity recognition. So this is, um, so we've looked so far only on images, right? So, you know, how do we look at video related problems? In this case, for example, the problem of saying, if I have some short video clip, I'd like to label it with a relevant label. So for example, you know, saying that this video clip represents somebody falling on the floor or this one has somebody climbing, et cetera. So it's quite similar, right? So there's a few differences. Um, related to the fact that you're dealing with a sequence of, of frames. Um, and so I'll just, I won't go through too much, but I'll just say like a two kind of, let's say key differences with respect to your typical image classification pipeline is that you, a dominant approach or dominant architectural approach for this problem is the one um, I'm showing you here called I3D by Carrera and Sissaman. And so what they do here is they have, um, rather than having 2D convolutions, they have 3D convolutions to take into account the fact that you were dealing with um, what you might call like an image cube, where you have, rather than having just one image frame, you have a sequence of frames, which you can stack into sort of like a cube. And so you apply a 3D convolution to this instead of like a 2D one. So that's one sort of key architectural difference with respect to images. The other one is that um, because you're dealing with motion, typically in the problem of activity recognition, somebody is, is doing something and that implies some sort of motion of this, of this person or object of interest. Um, there tends to be a separate flow of information related to optical flow. So optical flow is something I haven't mentioned, but it's typical class um, computer vision problem where you try to get, um, uh, you try to get a, an estimation of the disparity or at least of the, the movement of pixels from one frame to another, right? So this gives you, um, a representation of what motion is happening in the video. And so combining motion representations with visual representations is very, has been shown to be very effective for this task. Uh, sorry, Naila, um, just to warn you, there is five minutes left. Maybe we can leave a few minutes for a student's question if possible. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, maybe I will skip image generation. And um, I'm trying to remember what I have after this slide. I think I don't really have much. So maybe I will just uh, explain this, this example here. So um, this problem is something that maybe is not classically considered computer vision. Someone might con consider it actually more of like an inverse vision problem where you have, rather than starting from uh, an image and getting meaning, you're, you're trying to in, in, enforce meaning right onto an image. So you're trying to say, I would like this image to depict something specific. So um, to give an example, 
let's say you have an image that was taken in the summertime here, you would like to change the image such that it actually looks like it was taken in winter time. So this is a very, you know, very, so a, let's say like a more recent, but, um, but interesting problem that is becoming more popular in the vision community. And, you know, the building blocks for this are once again, you know, all the things I mentioned to you before, right? So a convolutional layer, um, this is a residual block, which I won't go into right now. And another sort of variant of a convolutional layer called a transpose convolutional layer. But really the, the core elements of this model are, you know, exactly the things that we've been discussing so far for this hour. And it basically takes in an input image, you know, has a series of convolutional layers and actually then starts to have um, transpose convolutional layers which outputs another image that has been um, that has been modified, a modified version of the input image. And I think I won't have time to go into too much of this, but feel free to ask um, if you'd like. Ah, and um, yeah, maybe just I mentioned very briefly self-supervised learning. This is also something I think that has been gained a lot of recent interest in the vision community. And here I'm showing you one example of this by Chen et al. that was very recently proposed. And I won't explain too much about this, but I'll simply say that um, this is a very interesting line of work, supervised, self-supervised learning in order to learn visual representations that are general, um, general purpose, um, discriminative representations that can be used for like, a variety of tasks. And what's interesting about this is that these, these approaches allow you to learn representations without having human um, annotations, right? So it's, it's a way to extract useful annotations in an automatic way um, and then use those annotations to train strong visual representations that can be used for all the types of tasks that we were actually just discussing previously. And so this is like an interesting future direction because one of the bottlenecks for deep learning models, as you may have heard, are you know, acquiring the data you need to train. So if we can find a way to kind of reduce that amount of data, it opens a lot of, um, a lot of possibilities. So I encourage you to look into this more or ask me questions if you have. Okay. And just to recap, we looked at sort of like these three different um, areas. What is computer vision? You know, what are convolutional networks? And how are they used to kind of tackle these problems today? And that's it. Thank you. And uh, happy to take questions. <laughs>